All right, so let's dive in. Um, again, happy Valentine's Day. I hope you and your donors and your teams are celebrating well. Um, if anyone has you know, great, great cookies or Valentine's Days they want to share, uh, just put it in the chat. I would love to see it. Okay, so this session is on what to expect from donor advised funds in 2023. Um, so that's what we'll dive into. A couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get in. This is approved for CFRE credits. Uh, thank you, colleague Amanda, who's wonderful for both putting a ton of work into the session and also for getting this approved. Um, and so at the end of the session, uh, we'll make, just make a note in the small survey we'll drop in the end. So that's uh, really, really important. Um, and so uh, that's that. Here's the agenda, um, pretty straightforward. You know, donor advice funds are growing. Why are they growing? What should we do about it? That's the whole sort of trend for the day. Um, we will send the recording and the slides to you after the fact. We would actually encourage you to share these with your colleagues. Um, I'll talk more about this in a second. Um, quick intro, my name is Patrick. Met a ton of you. Uh, lucky to be the co-founder of uh, Free Will alongside Jenny, pictured here, who's also great. And we get to work alongside this sort of kind, diverse, lovely, thoughtful team, 200 folks. Um, we've crossed the seven and a half billion dollar mark in terms of money raised for charity, which we're super pumped about. Um, we get to work with more than 1,100, closing in on 1,200 wonderful nonprofit partners. So if this is you, thank you. If you're thinking about it, we would love to have you join that group. Um, pretty awesome cohort. And then before we get started, one last thing here. Um, we love to say thank you for you joining these. And so uh, a special gift, and, and this technically a Valentine's gift for you, is that for 20 folks, we're going to share, uh, we're going to send you a copy of this book by Morgan Hustle. And the book is called The Psychology of Money. Um, I actually read this book about 10 days ago. I was on, I was on, took a week off on vacation. Highly recommend it. And among some other things, including some pretty good Agatha Christie and a couple of other great books by Barbara Kingsolver, which I loved. Um, I read this book called The Psychology of Money, and it was honestly outstanding. It's written at like a fourth grade level. It's, it's sort of the most digestible book about how people think about money I've ever encountered. Um, fourth grade is probably a little generous, but maybe an eighth grade level. Very readable, very interesting, very exciting. Um, a lot about uh, spending, savings, investing, how sort of people think about this. And, and so much of the, the money books on investing or spending are, are very technical, or they're very sort of, um, they're sort of like pure maximizing from an economic standpoint. And this really takes into effect human emotions and sort of what are the things that tip, trip people up. Um, so make a note, we're gonna send this to 20 folks as a gift, if not sort of strongly recommend it. But, but fundraisers are fundamentally a job about money and how people think about money. Um, also, there's a bunch of personal benefits to you reading this uh, on, top of, on top of, I think, you enjoying it. So please make a note uh, in the survey if you like it. Uh, we'd love to send it to you. If not, honestly, I recommend it as a quick read. It's probably $11, um, et cetera. And then one quick note before we dive into this. Uh, what I wanted to say is I think that this is the most important session we will do in 2023. I think that um, whether you are new to fundraising, um, or whether you are a longtime expert, what we're seeing is sort of a cataclysmic shift in the way fundraising happens, driven by the widespread adoption of donor advised funds. And so even if you are an expert and you've been in the field for 15 years, uh, this year, next year, over the coming five years, you are likely going to have to shift your work pretty dramatically. And if you are newer to the field and trying to build a career, getting really smart about donor advised funds is one of the top two or three most important things you can do. And so... Um, yeah, just want to say that, that of all, we will probably do 25, 26 sessions this year. Uh, and we think that this is actually the most important one. So the other ones are cool too. Don't, don't sort of skip out on all of them. But if you're only going to pay attention to one, if you're only going to share one with your coworkers, if you're only going to sort of go back and watch or take better notes, this is probably the week to do it. So just, just naming that. And we don't say, it's not like we say this every time. This is the only time we'll say that this year. But we think this is the most important. Um, all right. So before we dive in a little bit more, quick check on from you all how your week is going. Um, again, people are sort of doing pretty well this year. Um, you know, uh, strong uptick in happiness, uh, low on anxiety, um, low on loneliness. So that's all, all pretty good. And yet, what are we seeing here? Actually, a pretty significant dip in how people are feeling about hitting their goals this year. So I don't know if something happened in the last two weeks, whether you're sort of, you know, we actually saw relatively good economic news over the last two weeks. So I don't know if it's that. If anyone has anything that they want to share in the chat as to why they think this went down a bit. But generally, um, we're actually quite bullish this year in terms of what we're going to see in fundraising across the board. Uh, and I think that you should be as well. 
All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do a really quick donor advised fund 101. So we're going to be, we're going to be it's going to be overly simple for some of you, and then we're going to build and build and build on that. So if you know all of this, uh, just you know, chill. But for many of you, it's really worth deeply understanding how these work. What is a donor advised fund? Well, donors put money into an investment fund with what we call a sponsoring organization. And then out of these funds, they recommend grants to a charity like yours. Donors, big appeal. Uh, if I had a donor advised fund, I would get an immediate tax benefit, even if the money doesn't go to you for as many years as I want. And while donors technically, we have this word recommend grants, uh, sponsoring organizations almost never go against the donor's wishes, with the exception of things that are sort of out of policy. So uh, because if they did, nobody would go use, you know, if they were sort of doing whatever they wanted and not what you wanted, no one would use that donor advice fund. And so the incentive structure creates that this is basically an extended account that the donor controls and can grant up to you. Um, money is in the funds are usually invested. So it's not just sort of a pool of money in a flat checking account. They're usually invested. They're usually invested in mutual funds, but not always. So the fund grows over time. Organizations, right? The Fidelity Charitables of the world, how do they make money? You know, we sort of talk about them, but like, what's the business model? Well, the, there's usually a small fee uh, and usually we call BIPs or sort of parts per million, uh, parts per thousand, excuse me. So they might get a 10th of a percent, half a percent, 1% of the fund every year to manage all of it. And so they get the management of overall funds, and then many of these investments will be in mutual funds associated with the parent company. So if I have if I have $5 million in a Fidelity donor advised fund, I'm investing that potentially in a bunch of various Fidelity mutual funds. So the Fidelity parent company makes some money off of uh, the mutual funds. Now, in some cases, by the way, you have an investment advisor, right? So some, some of you will have a financial advisor. Some of your donors have financial advisors. Sometimes the financial advisor is managing the DAF under the umbrella of this, and they actually share a little bit of the of the management fee. So that, that's why the incentive for financial advisors to do it. Um, so what can you give to a donor advised fund? Well, you can, can you can give cash, but actually cash is not what's making up the most of donor advised fund money. Publicly traded stocks, securities, privately traded stocks, cryptocurrencies, mutual funds, et cetera, right? So this is all happening. Many, don't, many DAFs have a minimum contribution. We'll talk for a moment about DAFs and community foundations. Some of those are up to $500,000. Um, but oftentimes it's between five or 25,000 as a minimum. And yet two of the largest DAF holders, Fidelity and Schwab have $0 minimums. So they're really encouraging more people to sign up for these. This makes it very easy for more and more people to open a DAFs. And in a moment, you'll see how, what the result of this is. So as I mentioned, there's really three kinds of sponsoring organizations, right? The first is the oldest, right? These are community foundations that may hold a donor advised fund account in the foundation. They're usually, not always, but usually created for a local area. Second, national DAFs. These are what you hear most about. They hold the most money, they make the most grants, they have the most accounts. So we'll really be focusing a lot on these today. Charitable arms of financial institutions like Fidelity or Schwab or Goldman Sachs. And then the third is, is single issue DAFs. These are declining a bit in popularity, actually, even as DAFs explode. So typically, there's two types of these. One is organization specific. So I believe that Harvard has a DAF. I think Notre Dame has a DAF. I think the Autobahn Society, when I checked in with them a few years ago, they had a DAF. And it's sort of, you know, they manage it. Most of you aren't going to have this. It's really only if you're big enough to be managing a very sizable endowment and have a ton of complexity management capacity. Most people do this. There are also uh, some donor advised funds that are managed for faith-specific causes. So there's some Christian Christian uh, DAFs, there are some, some Jewish DAFs, there are a couple others of various other faiths, and certainly a lot of denominations within each. And so uh, this is interesting to see. When we asked you, is getting donor advised funds a priority for your organization this year, what we saw is a huge shift towards prioritizing DAFs. So a quarter of you said very, very high priority. Another quarter or so said it's a very high priority. Medium priority, 30%. And then you know, for, uh, only about 5% said a very low priority, only about 14% said a low priority. And when we dug into the numbers a little bit, the folks that say very low priority, those tend to be very, very small organizations, right? So, so most organizations with meaningful fundraising teams, which is many of you, but not all of you, these are the people that are saying, this is the year that we are freaking going to get good at DAFs for the first time, big, big, big priority. 
When we asked whether you accept, expected to receive more DAF gifts compared to last year, uh, almost half said yes. Basically, no one said no. And then a bunch of you said, I don't know yet. We'll find out. So I think the answer is actually most of you will be getting a lot more gifts than last year. But, right, so we've established super high priority. We want to get more gifts than the last year. And yet, you look at how confident people are in terms of getting these gifts, it's not that confident, right? These are almost the numbers we see when we talk about like cryptocurrency or something very new. 11% say very confident, 9% say confidence. Only, 20, only one in five said confident or very confident, right? A lot of people say neutral. And then we get a bunch of people said, you know, I don't really know this stuff. And that's okay. We're super glad you're here. Um, you know, the great thing about DAFs is it's not crazy hard. Um, so hopefully we'll get you a bunch smarter in the next 40 minutes or so and make this possible. Also, when we asked you about what the main challenges you had around DAF gifts, the biggest one we saw by far is, hey, I don't know who in my donor base has a donor advice fund. Second one is, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to market it. I don't know how to find out. I don't know how to get these gifts. A lot of people said, I need help figuring out the identities of people. We get these gifts and, and who knows where it's from. And, and suddenly I, you know, as a donor advice fund grantee, just sent you $40,000. And then I hear crickets from you because you don't know it's from me, but I don't know that you don't know it's from me. And so I'm mad. I might not be sending another gift and you get thanked. You know, it's not, not a great experience. Um, other people said, I don't know enough about DAFs to speak confidently. A couple other things as well. So let's dive in here, right? I mean, we think at Free Will that there's really three fundamental stories. And, and actually I actually think a fourth one's coming on in terms of the next decade of charitable giving. What are the big stories? One, the great wealth transfer, right? The most important sort of demographic driven shift of money ever happened. $70 trillion we passed on. If you're, if you're not sort of smart about the great wealth transfer, you know, we'll help you get there at a different time. Super important. Two, the rise of donor advice funds. And these are eating real time giving. And we'll talk about that in a second. Three, you know, partly because of the, the great wealth transfer, the rise of millennials over the next 10 years as a real philanthropic powerhouse. And then four, which, you know, we're going to see, probably do something on this later in the year, is the rise of artificial intelligence and philanthropy. But uh, we will dive into that at a different time, so don't stress about that now. All right, so let's look at how fast DAFs are growing. I mean, this is just astounding. This is how much money went into DAFs uh, in 2021. This, this is from the National Philanthropic Trust, so bless them for all the hard work they do. And, and as you look at these, I want you to remember, this is not what's happening this year. It's not even what happened last year. It's what happened in 2021. So we saw 47% growth. You can see year over year over year over year growth. And that is likely to continue. $73 billion went into DAFs by, uh, in 21, which was 47% 47 growth over 2020, which is wow. Um, in money coming out of DAFs, it trails money going into DAFs a little bit, but $46 billion, still $46 billion over 36 billion the year before, over 28 the year before, over 24, over, over 20. And so, so 24 over 20, 20% growth, right? I mean, you start to see this really big compounding growth. Um, Einstein would have told you that the most, the compound interest was the most powerful force in the universe. Compound growth is happening on donor advice funds. Um, so really sort of jaw dropping numbers. What else is happening? The number of accounts, right? Part of this is going up because more people have them. So we went from a million in 2020 to almost 1.3 million in 21. 30% growth in a year is jaw dropping for any financial instrument, for any type of charitable giving. This doesn't happen. And so that's why we think this is so, so important. I mean, even, you know, 12% growth, 19 to 20, maybe 20% growth, 18 to 19. Look at that gap between 17 and 18 even. I mean, that was an even, even more meaningful jump from a percentage standpoint. So you can see this is building and building and building. Um, Average size of an account was 183,000 is actually an increase over 2020. So what you might expect is, hey, more accounts are opening, therefore the average is going to go down, but more accounts open and the average went up. I mean, that's, that's really big news. Um, the other thing to note is, you know, money coming out of DAFs is growing even faster. So DAF payout rate, you know, a lot of people complain about DAFs, but actually the payout rate is way higher, way higher than private foundations. 27% payout rate in 2022. In 21, saw $46 billion to nonprofits. It's a lot of money. Um, five times increase in annual grant making over the last decade, right? It grew 400%. That's a 5X increase, 400% over the last decade, which is astounding. 
And again, consistently above this mandated minimum. Mandated minimum, by the way, is private foundations. So there's no mand mandated minimum for DAFs. Um, national DAFs, the Fidelity Schwabs, have the highest payout rates. Community foundations have lower payout rates. Beverly says, so the 27% is of what's in DAFs, that's correct. So basically the way we calculate payout rate is, hey, how much money was it there at the end of 2021? Okay, how much, how much got given out in 2022? How much was the end of 22? How much got given out in 23? So that's, uh, that's a bit here. And what we see here is that even as $46 billion came out, I mean, just look at how much money is sitting in DAFs. By the end of 2021, $234 billion, right? Almost a quarter of a trillion dollars sitting in donor advised funds, ready to be given out to organizations like yours. This is a 40% increase in 2020. Why is that? A whole bucket of money came in. And remember, these are invested. And so 2021, those some of you remember this, very, very good year for the stock market. Very, very good year for crypto. Very, very good year for mutual funds. And so all of this money that was sitting in there expanded even without more money going in, but also more money came in. So super, super important. Um, and so let's just talk about, when we think about all of our charitable giving portfolio, how, how big a fraction are DAFs, is DAFs, fraction? Um, grants from DAFs to qualified charities increased more than 60% over the past two years. Americans gave $485 billion to charity in 21. 73 billion of this was into DAFs, meaning 15% of all charitable giving in 21 was contributions to DAFs. This is up from 10% the year previous. I mean, think about how quickly this is growing. And so what does that mean? Well, sorry, we'll talk about that in a second. So when we think about this, there's let's go back to those three types. There's community foundations, there's national DAFs, and there are these single issue ones. And you might think, well, DAFs are growing, they're all growing, but they're going in different directions here. Um, so we have all these, okay? National DAFs are growing by far the fastest. So community foundations, 46 billion in assets, 10% growth, not bad, 10% is pretty good. Um, they, had, they did about 10 billion in uh, grants, which was a 16% increase. They're about, they're about one in every five total grant dollars. But national DAFs, different story here, 151 billion, 44% growth. So you can see that national DAFs are leaving community foundations in a bit of the dust. 32 billion in grants, a 41% increase. Again, you know, this, this gap is spreading year over year over year. 70% of total grant dollars. And then these single issue DAFs, right? These are again, sort of the faith related, some of the, the organization specific, an actual decrease in terms of money in there, um, decrease in the total number of grants. So what does this mean? It means that everything is sort of drifting towards national DAFs. Right, some money's increasing in community foundations, but but a lot of that is is getting cannibalized at the moment by national DAFs. Um, so let's sort of chat more about this as well, right? When we looked at this, we asked, but we did a we're in the midst of this. We'll publish this report very soon. I'm super excited about it. But we asked nonprofits, okay, great, these are some numbers from 21. What did we learn about 2022 that hasn't yet been published? Well. We saw 31% more DAF gifts. And those surveyed said they got 69% more DAF dollars on average compared to the year previous. So we're seeing a huge jump into 2022. Why is this? More gifts and the average gift size went up, right? So big news across the board. This report is coming out very soon. Our team's working super hard on it. Uh, and so you wanna make a note in the survey at the end if you'd like a copy of this when it comes out. I guess it's probably gonna come out in the next eight to 15 days. Uh, we're just doing some finalization here. But not everyone grows equally. And you know, a lot of you said early, I don't really know how to market this. I don't know what I'm doing here. And yet what we see is organizations that ask for donor advised funds versus organizations that don't are a huge difference. Two and a half times how much, you know, how much money you expect to get, whether you're asking for them or you're not, whether you're actively soliciting or you're not. Now, this isn't a surprise, right? Number one rule of fundraising is you don't get what you don't ask for. Right? You, you all know that. And yet a lot of people are not currently asking for donor advised fund gifts, even though they're making up this enormous segment of giving. All right? This is extremely important to donors. We'll talk about this a few times, but you know, we talk about you know, these donor advised funds are growing so quickly. It's whiplash for the nonprofit sector. Well, this is your full-time job. For donors who have no idea what's going on here, right? they're totally new to a donor advised fund, there's so much learning to be done here. When do I give? Oh, I forgot I even had one because it's not top of mind, right? And so it's really important for us to be on top of this. 
And, you know, it's sort of unclear whether 2023 is going to be a recession year or not, right? It's all over the, all over the, the map. One of the things we saw about DAFs is that when we asked people, 68% said DAFs are more important to organizations in 2023 compared to previous years. And, and 53% think they're more important in recessions. And zero said less important, zero, right? And so what does this mean? Well, cash goes up and down, you know, stock market goes up and down, crypto goes up and down, other things go up and down. And yet this money is a pool that's already set aside, right? I can't take it back to spend money on, on vacations or restaurants or even medical needs, right? This money is gone. And so economic hard times, economic good times doesn't matter. And in fact, in economic hard times, I might say, oh, this is a good impetus for me to spend even more because the charity needs it and I can't get that back. So when we think about economically uncertain years, which 2023 definitely falls in that category, right? If anyone can tell me exactly what's going to happen in 2023, either you're lying or you know, you're in the, the wrong uh, uh, part of work here. And so this becomes incredibly important in 2023. But so, all right, so we've already covered, look, these are wildly important to strategy. Um, they're growing enormously, but, but why, right? Understanding why helps us unlock better strategies for getting DAFs. It also helps us uh, unlock better fundraising strategies, not for DAFs. So we'll talk about that in a second. So reason one, um, there's this, this I think is a relatively minor reason, by the way. I think some people overly attribute this, but there's a shift in tax policy. Many of you know this, um, Republican, Pat, Republican Congress and then President Trump uh, enacted something called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, I believe. It takes effect in 2018. And for a bunch of reasons, it made more sense for donors to give a large sum, large, excuse me, a large sum in one year and then spread out DAF giving over the years, right? Because the big shift here, as we raise the minimum standard deduction, only 10% of people right now itemize deductions compared to 30% in 2017. So a really big shift. This is also, by the way, you know, for those of you that, that, that have a lot of older donors, and that's most of you why qualified charitable distributions out of your IRA got so much better because these actually play a role for people that aren't itemizing deductions, huge win to give them uh, to take a QCD. Two, uh, this is really, really, really important and people don't understand this enough about why DAFs grow so much. Two thirds of stuff, of assets, of value going in to these financial, excuse me, these national uh, donor advised funds, which are the ones that are growing the fastest, are non-cash assets. Donors are getting smarter about the tax benefits of crypto, stock, mutual funds, et cetera, which for some people can mean up to 70% savings on a gift because we're remember, we're avoiding capital gains and getting that full income tax deduction. And so you know, we will often tell you about the really important research that shows that, that organizations focused on non-cash grow much faster, and DAFs are the epitome of that laser focused on non-cash. More than two thirds or roughly two thirds of their gifts are non-cash. And that's a lot of the reason why they're growing so quickly. This is a huge deal, right? Reason three, they make it really easy to give. So they have this whole focus on non-cash and they've tried to make it as simple as possible for donors, to, uh, make it really intuitive to give stocks and other things. Many have re removed the, the minimum amount, right? Making it more accessible. And remember, Yes, you know, DAFs are great. Tax reason, you know, the reason we think the tax thing isn't that big is because if it were, you know, community foundations would be growing much faster. But instead, it's this ease of accepting non-cash gifts and the and the simplicity and the focus on it by national DAFs, which are driving insane growth, which is a good hint. We'll talk about this later. For you, a similar focus on non-cash gifts can also lead, maybe not quite, you know, 50% year over year, but considerably more growth. And organizations that focus on this grow up to six times faster than organizations that don't. And so this is really important. You know, um, da national DAFs are example number one of the strategy, and that is why they are the fastest growing types of organizations in the United States. Right? And we know this because these are the ones that are attracting new donors, attracting new dollars, increasing their grant making. So they must be doing something right. Okay, so we have a little bit of, of the stage set here. We know, boy, this is an incredibly important year. These gifts are off the charts. We understand a little bit more of why DAFs are growing so much. And now let's talk about, you know, that's all fun, right? It's great to have the academic understanding of why this is, but you have a job to do. You have to raise a bunch of money for your organization. And so how do we actually do that? 
Well, first, you know, before we get to that, I'm not, I'm not hiding the lead here. We want to understand how much money is likely to come out of DAFs into organizations like yours in 2023. And so let's do some simple math here. We're going to remember that $46 billion came out in 2021, one of the highest increases on record. Uh, and so we're not going to say maybe it's going to go up that much all the time. Instead, let's do some simple math here, right? $46 billion came in 2021 grants. The average comp compound average growth rate, which means on average, how much does it increase every year? Those of you that are more financy, uh, we'll call this CAGR, right? So you'll hear this a lot in investments, CAGR. Endowed grants has been 23.4% over the past five years. What does that mean? In an average year, the amount uh, coming out of Dallas grows up by 23.4%, right? Pretty simple. If we hold these rates constant, we would expect $57 billion in grants in 2022 and $70 billion in grants in 2023. Now, keep in mind, these numbers estimate a slowdown in the growth from 2020 to 2021, right? So it's slower, and that may or may not happen. These could be conservative estimates. And yet 57 billion last year, which is, you know, we, we just showed you, wow, there, you know, a lot of people are reporting a lot more gifts, higher value gifts, more money across the board, 70 billion this calendar year, 70 billion, which means that in 2023, we would expect that one in every five individual giving dollars is coming from a donor advisement. 20% potentially of your, your fundraising budget could come from donor advice funds in 2023. I mean, this is a huge amount. What it also means is that there is no serious path to fundraising success in 2023 that does not have a plan for donor advice funds. I'm going to say this again. There, this is why we think this is the most important session of the year. There is no serious path to fundraising success in 2023 that does not have a plan for donor advice funds. So super, super, super important. And remember, when we look at trends, they're unlikely to drop off, right? They're likely to continue. And so we would expect this to be even more true in 2024. And I don't have the math in front of me, so maybe someone can help out here. If What, what is 23.4% growth on a base of 70 billion? I don't know for sure, but I think it's something like 83, 84 billion. So someone can maybe do the quick math and put it in the chat, um, uh, but that will be good. So what do we do about this? We're looking at potentially $70 billion in, uh, in 2023, maybe 80 plus in 2024. Uh, by the way, we're not, thank you. Uh, no, that's not quite right. Um, and, um, uh, and by the way, just for uh, those with the, um, the DAF report, you'll, we're not monitoring the chat in this way. Um, thank you, Robert Danzig, by the way, uh, one of the smarter consultants in the space um, showing 86 billion potentially coming out in, in 2024. So um, hold on there. Um, and on the DAF report, by the way, you'll have to make a note in the survey uh, after the chat, we, we can't monitor in the, excuse me, in the survey after the webinar, we can't monitor the chat. All right, so let's dive in here. Um, we're understanding our DAF donors. And remember, these are relatively new to you. They're super new to donors. So we have a lot of opportunity to shape how people are gonna do it. So what we're doing now in 2023 really matters for all of the giving over the next five years because people are beginning to understand, hey, how do I use my donor advice fund? What should I do? How do I give here? What's most valuable? So let's dive in a bit more. Donors opening DAFs are starting to shift younger. 79% of donors are over 50, but 13% of DAFs in, in 2019 were opened by millennials, which is honestly the last year we have demographic information available for. Part of this shift, you know, why are millennials showing up here? Well, partly millennials are stepping into their high income earning years. So there's more to give. And part of it is that some workplaces are adding DAFs as a perk and more sponsor organizations are offering low or zero minimums. So if you had $25,000 minimums, mm, you're probably scared away a lot of millennials. But as we lower that to zero, as maybe we make, you know, payroll able to fund that, suddenly this is opening up a lot. So that's interesting to see. Um, what else are we seeing? Well, they're actively engaged in giving. So 91% of Fidelity charitable DAFs made at least one grant in 21. The average account made nine grants. So this is becoming the de facto way that people give. In fact, many are giving about 60% of the time out of their DAFs and 40% of the time out of other things. 
These folks are committed to their favorite charities and causes. Most of the grants from Fidelity went to a charity the donor had previously supported. This is super, super, super important to understand. The key takeaway is your DAF gifts are going to come from your existing donors primarily. There is not some secret cabal of DAF donors that you don't have access to. These are the people already in your database that you're already communicating to. And our job is to put DAF giving in front of them, make it easy and accessible when we're doing our normal fundraising. This is a really important thing. People are, think they're gonna go give this big presentation to Fidelity and suddenly the money's rolling in and that is not true. We'll talk more about that in a second. The important thing to do is be in front of your donors and offer DAF giving in your normal, um, your normal flow of fundraising. We also wanna understand, and we talk about this when we talk about older donors, all your older donors are getting much more tech savvy than they used to be. And all of your donors are increasingly tech savvy. Almost all national DAF donors go online to recommend grants. In fact, the number at Fidelity is 94%, right? This is the, you know, these are people that are comfy with online giving. We also want to think about our board members and particularly people forget about your ex-board members. And this is a big mistake. So previous board members fit the demographic, the psychographic, the behavioral trends of donor advised fund donors. And so let's make a list of these people this week and then over the next month, call to check on them and make sure you ask whether they have a donor advised fund, right? People forget, people put so much attention on their current board members, they forget past board members who look exactly the same in capacity, in willingness to give, in the way they care about your organization. And so this is a big miss that people are making, but easily, easily correctable. Um, also, is that Stanley? I don't know. I saw this was a great, uh, was a great uh, stock image. So let me know. I don't know if it's just the glasses. Great question in the chat. Step two, in every major donor conversation, we want to be asking about this. Why is it? Because it's so important that we unearth who has donor advice funds. Here's a way to do it. Many of our supporters are increasingly give out of, don give out of a donor advice fund. Would you like information on how other people are using their DAFs to make a bigger impact? This isn't, hey, do you have a DAF? This is, can I offer some value? Um, and, and they might say a couple things. I don't have a DAF. They might say, I don't have a DAF, but actually we were looking into, into opening one. And so if we do, we'd love to hear more about it. And I'll let you know when that happens. Or three, actually, I do have a DAF. And you know it's sort of new to us, so we'd love to hear more. These are all good options. So it's really important. You want to develop some, some donor stories. Hey, this person used their DAF to do X, you know, in case it's interesting to you. Three, we are stunned. We remain stunned at how many CRMs don't have a tag for has a donor advised fund. It is crazy important that you understand who in your database has one of these. Everyone you find in surveys and conversations, even if they haven't given this way yet, we really want to know who has a DAF. You can always, if you know, if you need to hack it, you can repurpose a different tag here. Um, and so that's an important point. But if we don't have data around who is a donor advised fund, we're missing out on incredible opportunities to go solicit these folks. Right? Remember that our donor advised fund people are the people that we know have money and they have willingness to give. Right? That's why they have a donor advised fund. Um, this is really important, right? On your ways to give site, we want to make sure we have this type of language and we will send you the slides after this and you can copy and paste this. When you make a donor advised fund gift, it is possible that the sponsoring organization will not share your info with us. Please send us a note at email address or fill out this form when you made a gift so we can make sure to thank you and ensure sure your gift goes to where it is intended, right? This is really important. People don't know how DAFs work. They don't know that often your information, their information is not going to transfer to you. And so when you don't say thank you, they are bummed, right? They are really frustrated because this is probably the biggest gift they've ever made. Step five, we're going to talk about navigating national DAFs. As I mentioned, they are not very active in recommending nonprofits. They are not seen as philanthropic experts. So outreach, outreach to national DAFs is a poor use of your time. And instead, you want to cultivate your supporters and donors. Really, really important. But we want to make sure that things like our guide star profile is up to date, as this is used by a national a resource to make sure that you are legit before they will release a fund. So you don't have to put a ton of work in here, right? It doesn't mean make it best in class and impress everybody. Just make sure it's generally up to date. Make sure your accounting information is there, things like that. And we do want to make sure we understand the massive growth of these entities. And then six, right? We're talking about community foundations. These play a more active role, 
right? They're not growing as fast as the nationals, but a more active role. How do we do this? Um, what we find is the best advice is to do this. Set up a coffee or tea with someone. And this is, by the way, only if you're really a local organization, right? So if you're a Dayton zoo, um, you can go hang out with the folks in Dayton. You can't go to Boston and say, hey, does anyone want to fund things uh, in Ohio? And ask them, hey, what are your big donors looking to fund? And that way, when we have an opportunity, we can bring it to you, right? This type of way is going to get much better information than you just saying, you know, we're the best. Here's a slide about why we're the best. Here's another slide about all the things we do. Here's another one, right? Because they have a job to do the community service, to the community foundation staff operate in service to their donors, helping them fund the kind of impact they want to have. So we need to understand what is the problem they're trying to solve and what are they looking to fund? And then when we have things that fit that category, or we can even sort of present in a way that fits that category, that's the moment to go back to those people and say, hey, remember when we had lunch last spring and you said, you know, I'm looking for X? Well, well, actually, X is a big opportunity we're looking to fund. You know, do you think we can sort of chat about how to get this opportunity in front of that donor? Um, this way we share projects and funding, et cetera, right? So we're really looking at specific actionable funding opportunities instead of just general fund stuff for community foundations. Tip seven, this is the most important by far, right? So most important thing in the most important webinar of the year. Uh, DAFs need to be an option every time you send fundraising emails or every time you send mail, right? There was a moment in your organization's history and you were probably not there for it, right? This is before much of our time where the organization was saying, hey, should we offer credit cards? You know, should, should credit cards be a thing? I don't know, they're sort of new. People just, you know, rich people use them at restaurants. And then along the way, people said, yeah, it's a way that people want to give. And, and actually we find out that people give a little bit more when they give out a credit card. And so this is a big thing. This is the credit card moment for DAFs. Every time a donor gives with it, who has a DAF, gives you cash instead of a DAF, we lose, right? That is a, you know, you might think, wow, I'm so happy to get hundred dollars. It's really a big negative if they didn't give with the DAF because these are gonna be much smaller than the same donation from their DAF. And we lose the chance to identify a DAF holder, which is honestly sort of gold at this point. Right? We know that someone has a DAF, that they care about us, that they have means and they have charitable intent. And that money can never come back to them. So stock market crashes, we're going to these people and says, hey, now's the time, right? Good times, those DAFs are probably growing. We still say, hey, now's the time. Here's a bunch of things to fund. So when we miss opportunities to identify DAF donors, it's a huge loss, not just because that, that gap in how big the gift's gonna be, but because you've sort of lost that on potential lifetime giving because we don't know to ask. So this is incredibly, incredibly important. This needs to be baked in to your normal giving. Um, on your donate page, there needs to be a link to give from my DAF, the same way you have credit card buttons, the same way you have PayPal buttons, right? So most of you have this. Make sure to get it on. Um, wildly important. Remember that DAFs are new to donors too, as we've said. And so we really need to remind folks about this as well. So super, super important, right? It's not going to be immediately obvious to you, to donors, when you ask them for money, that they should give them a DAF because they may have only had a DAF for four months, right? Three, you know, 300,000 people opened them up in 21. We can imagine that a similar number are gonna open them up in 22 and 23, brand new. And so we need to be reminding people that they can do this. Um, you wanna capture information on the, on the gift that's coming in and um, make sure that they have the right information, right? So that page at its most basic form, if you're gonna do it totally yourself, um, which a lot of people do, either say, hey, just email us to make a note or fill out this form. I am gonna show you um, uh, something that's pretty advanced. So we are, uh, we're working with a bunch of partners now to launch this over the next few weeks. And we think it's one of the coolest things that we've done in a very long time. And so excited to do this. Um, what we built is to really help solve this problem of what we call donor advised funds with free will as part of our smart giving suite uh, teamed up with our friends at Chariot to provide some of the underlying tech. So this part is sort of, you know, let's make sure we're capturing information. Where does the gift go? This is for Acme, right? Pretend organization. Where do you want to, where do you want to allocate it to? What's your name? What's your phone number? What's your email address? So we can follow up with you, right? And then, you know, where's it coming from? So when we get a check from Fidelity, we know, wow, that came from Mark, right? We can really tie it up. That is super important. Super, super important. But then the cooler thing, is that actually this technology integrates with a lot of the top DAFs. And so from your checkout page, you can log in to Fidelity uh, without, leaving the, without leaving your donate page. You can make a $45,000 gift out of your DAF, for instance, right? And it actually tells you, you can see up there, well, I've got $10 million in my DAF. 
And so you can see in real time how much you have and you can make a gift as well, um, super important. And then in seconds, um, the whole gift is made. So you can actually now check out on your donate page with your donor advised fund, which means I know you're a donor advised fund, a donor, and I'm getting a way bigger gift. And frankly, we're like most excited about this compared to anything we built in the back cave over the last five years. And so um, this is super, super, super exciting. And we think it's gonna be revolutionary for a lot of folks because why is it so important? When we think about this sort of, you know, not just DAFs, we'll talk more about smart giving, other giving types in a second. We wanna do it in a way that doesn't put extra work on our teams. And so when we can put it in our normal flow, right? You're, you, have, you guys have annual giving teams that are busting their butts to write great emails about a key moment that's happening, a key reunion, right? A new opening at the museum. And instead of sort of doing separate things all the time with non-cash stuff, when we bake it into that, and we'll talk about this in a second, that's what unlocks all this potential, right? So that is, that is the number one strategy that successful organizations will do in 2023. So um, what are some of the advanced strategies? We talked about some basic stuff. Uh, first one, we want to suggest recurring gifts. And when we ask for recurring gifts, we want to give a why to make a recurring gifts. Many donors, remember, they're totally new to folks, do not know that donations are an option from donor advised funds, that recurring donations are. And so here's some really good language. One of the biggest barriers to even more impact is that we often don't have certainty about how much money will come in during a given year. Many people choose to make a recurring gift because it allows us to plan more thoughtfully and make the most of your donations. Remember, you can always, always cancel if you change your mind. So that's one, right? So we're gonna use that language with donor advised fund donors. Two, ask about beneficiary designations. Many donors, because this is so new, do not have beneficiary designations for their dApps. One thing I've seen is that many of our donors forget to add beneficiary designations. You may have already thought of this, right? So we're being really generous with the donor, but just in case I wanted to raise it, would you like me to talk through some of the options? And they can allocate the DAF to you. They can also give it to a spouse or kids to recommend grants, right? That money's never going to the spouse or kids, but they can recommend grants. Three, uh, let's talk about matching gifts. So people forget this all the time. All of your donors forget it. You guys forget it. Really, really important because you automatically double your gift. Many donors don't know that employers may match grants from DAFs, but they don't match, for the most part, donations to DAFs. Thank you so much for your grant. You may already know this, but many of our supporters don't realize they can get their donor advised fund gifts matched by their employer. Does your employer do matching gifts? Now, why is this important? Remember, we saw the rise of millennials and, and Gen X doing more of these. These people are still employed, right? Some boomers are still employed as well. Um, not knocking you all, but... Um, really key because sometimes the $3,000 gift, $5,000 gift, that gets doubled. And that's pretty great. All right. So before we wrap up and move into questions and some other things, I want to sort of double down on this best way to be exceptional in DAFs. Remember, right, this is really important. If, we, if, if our organization had grown at the same rate national DAFs are, we would be in the Hall of Fame of fundraisers. And so we need to understand why these grow so fast. They grow so fast because two thirds of all funds going to DAFs are non-cash assets, primarily stock, primarily mutual funds and crypto and other things like that, right? So what we're seeing here is that this is what's driving the growth. National DAFs are growing the fastest because they make it the easiest to make non-cash gifts, which is largely responsible for their growth. If you as a nonprofit make it easy and accessible for donors to give stock or mutual funds or crypto, many will also skip the DAF because now they know, right? DAFs are doing a good job of educating folks about the value of donating non-cash gifts, as are many of you. And so we want, when possible, we love DAF gifts, but we love that stock directly to us even sooner. It also takes a lot of risk out. And so we're doing that really well. This is what I'm saying. In normal fundraising emails, start including asks around smart gifts like stock or crypto or donor advised funds in every email. Just make it a little parenthetical, right? Doesn't have to be the focus of it. As an example, please consider donating today using credit cards, gift of stock or crypto, or your donor advice funds. Same email otherwise. This thing doesn't have to change every week, right? So if your team's writing a lot of this, super, super, super important. And so place a link to things like giving stock, giving crypto, or giving my donor advice funds 
on the main donate page, as we talked about with the, with DAFs earlier, not just on your ways to give page. When we're asking for gifts, we wanna be asking for these. Here's a great example from the United Way. You can see that on their main donate page, little check boxes that open up and explain a lot more about this types of giving. And here's the secret about non-cash giving, right? This is super, super interesting. Research shows that reminding people about their investments and assets leads them to spending more, or in our case, giving more. So including smart giving options alongside cash in normal fundraising outreach has two huge upsides. Well, the first is we're gonna get more of these gifts and they're a lot larger. Plus we also know who, the, who has these. You know, so great to know a stock donor, so great to know a DAF donor, so, so great to know someone out of their retirement account because we can get them to give and give again out of this. But the second thing is that anchor point and reminding people of their investments and their assets will increase the size of your cash gifts as well. So this is a huge win for your annual giving team, for your major giving team across the board, right? This is a really, this is sort of like the two sentences that can double your success in your fundraising emails and not enough people do it, but some really smart ones do. And then one more thing as we think about navigating DAFs is, you know, folks that have a DAF might say, hey, can I, can I pay for the banquet table? Answer is no. Bifurcated payments cannot be used by DAFs. By bifurcated, we mean things that are partially tax deductible. But you can do stock giving, you can do crypto. One of our partners generated hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for recent Gala by saying, hey, people can pay in crypto if they want. And suddenly they see this as a new, you know, different way to think about it, saves them some capital gains, you know, not a full tax deduction because you, you, know, you have to subtract the value of the dinner or whatever it is. Um, but this is really, really important. And so if you've got a DAF donor and you have a big event, say, oh, you know, well, you can't pay with your DAF, but, but you're probably used to giving stocks because, you know, that's how you funded a DAF. You can pay this way, right? And so this is really, really important. Um, all right. So that wraps up some of the tips. A couple of resources. One is we just love this book. Uh, I've recommended it to, I recommend to my younger brother by text last night, which is how you, how you know that I really, uh, really appreciate this book. And so we're going to send this to 20 folks as a gift. Um, my uh, friend and colleague Amanda is going to drop the survey in the chat now. So you just have to make a note here. Um, so please do that if you can. Second thing, a lot of you ask, there, thanks Amanda, um, for the DAF report. And so we'll be sending this out sometime in the next two to three weeks. And so we would love to share with you Again, just make a note in the survey and that way we can send it out to you. A ton of interesting data, including by cause area. So if you're higher ed, if you're a museum, if you're a healthcare uh, nonprofit, you'll get to see what kind of trends are happening in your sector on top of just these sort of broad generalizations. It's super, super cool. Um, much more there. So make a note in the survey there if you haven't done it already. And then, um, you know, just 10 seconds on what Free Will is working on these days. Uh, well, we have we have basically the best in class plan giving suite. Number one is use the state tool in the country, um, legacy gifts, estate planning for supporters, driving billions and billions of dollars in plan gifts, beneficiary designations, which are super important, all that stuff, really great. Um, we have recently launched what we call the smart giving suite, which is donor advised funds, stocks, IRA gifts, what are called QCDs, crypto, and the donor advised fund stuff that we walk through, as well as sort of best in class data. So you can really track it, get into your CRM, all those things, um, we would love to show it to you. And so next Thursday, nope, sorry, this Thursday in two days, um, we are going to hang out uh, for anyone that wants to, to join for half an hour and really walk through how that DAF tool works, how it plays with the stock tool, with qualified travel distributions and crypto. And really what it is, is a low effort, high return thing to help your donors give non-cash gifts at a moment where they become obviously more important than ever before. So we're super excited about that. And then also um, we're doing a bit on, in uh, two weeks after that, we'll do a whole session on the plan giving side. So the plan giving bit, uh, that will be really valuable too. But uh, if you only attend one of these this year, uh, please come in two days. Uh, we're super excited to show you more about the DAF tool to show you how it interplays with, with stock giving and how you can really help your donors have all of this. So in the survey, uh, that as well. Anjali says, will you send out an email for a Thursday session that we can sign up? Um, Anjali, if you make a note in the survey, we will add you to the calendar invite. So please do that. Um, or Anjali, let me know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
Um, all right, so that's that. We're going to do Q&A now. Uh, if you haven't already, please take a moment to fill that survey out. Uh, it's so valuable to us. Um, also, it's the way to get the book and the report. And if you're interested in signing up on Thursday's session, um, plus, by the way, in the survey, you can also sign up. Um, we love taking time. We've got a big team uh, to sit with you one on one and talk about, hey, what's, uh, you know, what what might some of these tools mean for your organization around smart giving, around plan giving, all that stuff. So if you want to have one of those one on one sessions, uh, feel free to make a note there and someone will reach out to you uh, super quickly. Um, all right. So it is 1255. Um, I want to quickly tell you uh, that we are going to do a session in two weeks that I'm so excited about called The Most Important Research in Modern Fundraising with Dr. Russell James, <coughs> who is coincidentally what I think is the most important academic researcher in modern fundraising. Many of you know uh, Dr. James or Russell, depending on how friendly you are with him. He is wonderful out of Texas Tech. He's so smart. Um, I have, he's probably the person in the world that I have learned the most from about, uh, about modern fundraising. And so if you'd like to join that, uh, we will invite you and you should come. It's in two weeks. It will be great. Um, all right, so let's do a couple of Q&A, but we, we don't have a lot of time um, because we've covered so much today. So um, let me see some of the questions. And actually, before we do that, just wanted to say, because uh, some of you are going to have to drop off in a second, a huge, huge thank you for joining. Um, this is an incredibly important topic. It can be a little complex. It is going to be one of the keys to unlocking uh, your potential to hit your own goals, both from a career standpoint, from a team standpoint, to fund the incredibly important missions you do. And so just unbelievable, um, unbelievable thank you for doing that. Uh, if you haven't filled out the survey yet, um, let us know. Less than 1% of you are going to have trouble opening it because you have like a, a blocker at work. Uh, we'll follow, we'll send that to you an email and you can always open it on a different computer. Um, all right, a couple questions. Uh, Chuck says, can DAFs be used to pay a pledge? Uh, legally, no, no. Um, technically or practically, ish, yes, ish. What, what, what organizations do is they, they, you know, they cancel the pledge, which is often legally binding. You can't fulfill a legally binding pledge with a DAF. What you can do is change it to a letter of intent. I intend to fund this scholarship for five years out of my donor advised funds with Charles Schwab I recognize that this is non-binding and legal, right? That's basically this letter of intent, not legally binding, in practicality, pretty useful. Also, most charities don't sue people that break pledges, so it has a lot of the same effect. Um, yeah, so that's uh, pretty important. Woody says, we do a non-binding commitment and write them down. Um, Avi says, should we focus more on encouraging people to set up DAFs in the first place or more on encouraging people to make gifts through their DAFs? Um, Avi, we need to focus on getting people to make gifts through their DAFs. Why is that? Well, partly there is a ton of work being done by people that are not us to encourage people to set up DAFs. Who's that? National DAFs, community foundations. Everyone's individual financial advisor is what's helping to push this trend. So that's all happening behind the scenes. We would say focus on getting gifts for your organization out of donor advised funds. I'm happy to chat more about that, but that is super important. Um, many people says, how do we solicit DAFs if we don't know who has them? How do we easily identify people who have a DAF? Um, when we look at this, right, what we're seeing is that an increasingly large percentage of the United States adult population, particularly those over 45 who are more likely to be our donors, particularly those who are have some giving capacity, which are again, more likely to be your donors, are either have DAFs or likely to open them in the next two or three years. Therefore, what that means is that we should be including it as an option. Instead of saying, hey, you know, we're not gonna send a 10 million person email that says, give me your DAF. What we will say is 10 million people give. And either we say give, you know, and then on the donate page, there's the option. Or what we should be doing is more and more emails sort of helping people understand the smart ways to give. And among your audience, the people that have DAFs, crypto, IRA accounts, or stock is very broad. Now you don't know who has which, but it's very broad. And so you can actually email out to, to a much bigger group and say, hey, think about this. So that's super, super useful. Um, 
there's a question around how long are funds allowed to sit in donor advised funds? What's the incentive for donors to pay out DAFs? Well, uh, legally, there is no requirement as of yet. Now, law may change, but there's no requirement as of yet to, uh, to give it out. And yet, payout rates are way higher than they are for foundations, which do have a legally minimum uh, payout rate. Um, financial incentive is it's not the donor's money. And so they don't have to give it, but it doesn't do anything. You don't get to spend it on yachts and vacations. It just sits there. And, and these are, and what we see is that people are actually decent people, right? Plenty of people are giving you not for tax reasons. And so the incentive is, you know, you tell me that I can have impact X if I make this fund out of my donor advice fund. It doesn't cost me anything because I can't use that for my own good. I can't use that for my own consumption. And so that, that's why, right? We see people are really aggressively paying out of these funds, which is really good news for us, especially because there's 200 billion plus sitting there. So strong encouragement to sort of keep asking and push that out there. All right, it is one o'clock on the East Coast. Uh, it is now 10 a.m. on the West Coast. Many of you have other meetings. So let's pause there. I want to wish you a extremely happy Valentine's Day. And again, just say a really big thank you uh, for joining. Loved having you here. Love all the, the homework that we get to do to get smarter about this so we can share it with you. Um, big shout out to my friend and colleague, Amanda, who put a ton of work in to make this possible. And I will see you in two weeks, hopefully, if not on Thursday. And again, please join us on Thursday. We think that will be quick and fun.